Welcome to Passing the Plate, the podcast that's all about food, traditions, and the incredible connections they create. I'm Ashley Covelli, the food writer and recipe developer behind Big Flavors from a Tiny Kitchen. And I'm Lisa Listen, the genealogist and family history expert behind Are You My Cousin? We are your guides on this flavor-packed adventure. We're not just talking about recipes. We're diving into family history, exploring new cultures, and preserving favorite recipes for future generations. In short, we're celebrating the stories and tastes that come with every bite. So grab a seat at the table and let's head out on a journey of flavor, tradition, and connection. This is Passing the Plate, where every episode is a feast for the senses and a celebration of togetherness. How sensitive are your taste buds? In this episode, we'll be doing a live experiment to see if we qualify as super tasters. So I was digging around for something on the internet recently, and I came across this article on todayifoundout.com that has an at-home experiment to find out if you're a super taster. So I thought it'd be fun to make an episode out of that and see if uh, Lisa was interested. And when I told her, she was all in. So we're going to do a little science experiment. We always talk about for science, but this one's like actually kind of scientific. So I only just learned about that term super taster recently, like in the last year. So when you shared that article with me, I was really intrigued because it's kind of come back up again a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Plus, we see all these things in um, with the DNA testing through the you know Ancestry.com and the different genealogy databases. And you can opt in for traits to see what might be inherited and, you know, are you similar to, say, you know, your parents or your siblings. So it's, it was really an interesting concept. And so I was definitely all in for that. So yeah, and I've, I've always kind of suspected that maybe I was a super taster, but like me and my mom both were like super sensitive to tastes. And like, she can tell if something got cooked in oil that fish had been fried in. And I can tell if a cutting board had been used for like garlicky onion things, but then we cut fruit on it. Um, The the time that I always think about is my father in law had made sangria and he was a great cook and he always cooked a lot. But I'm I'm drinking the sangria and it tastes like garlic and he was Italian. So he cooked with a lot of garlic. And I said, did you happen to cut this on the same cutting board as you do garlic? And even though he cleans the boards, obviously, um, yeah, I was just really picking up and like garlic I love, but not in a sangria. It's not really Mm. my thing. So, so at my house, I kind of take it to the next level and I have certain cutting boards that are only for sweets. So I will never cut anything other than like fruit or like maybe a bell pepper because that's, you know, kind of sweet still. But I would never cut like garlic, onions, meat on those particular boards. Oh, wow. No, no. So I had not even thought about that. I, I know to some, sometimes that people will separate out like you know, meat versus vegetables or something like that with their cutting boards for, um, you know, making sure there's no cross contamination. Um, certainly I do that, you know, when I'm cooking, but I don't have specific. I don't have special cutting boards for certain types of foods. Um, I actually don't think I'm a super taster based on having read that article. Mm -hmm. And um, because what it's my, I didn't really know what that super taster was. And so this is all internet research guys. So internet research disclaimer right here. (laughs) Supposedly a super tester is somebody who actually has more taste buds than average. And apparently they say it's about 25% of the population are considered super tasters, which seemed kind of high to me. I was yeah, surprised by that. That's a lot. But they often, but super tasters are will be classified sometimes as picky eaters. Mm-hmm. Sometimes um, they tend to have a more of a general dislike of green vegetables, things like broccoli. There's very intense flavors. Mm-hmm. I've heard coffee, grapefruit juice, soy products all tend to be things that super tasters are not really crazy about. And even superly overly sweet things, which definitely rules me out right there. So interestingly, I used to not like bitter things, grapefruit, stuff like that. I mean, I always was a fan of coffee, but um, and I don't like overly sweet things. So I kind of I've trained myself over the years. I love green vegetables now. I'm a very big fan of grapefruit. I like soy products. So I'm not sure um, where I'm going to fall in here because I feel like I've kind of forced myself over the years to like things that I didn't used to like. I know my mom definitely is very much doesn't like a lot of these things. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm very curious if she would do this on, on the side and see what results she gets to. <laughs> I know, we should have had her join us for this. That would have been fun. 
All right, so if you want to do this experiment along with us, or when you're done listening, feel free to do that. You don't need many things, really. All you need is blue food coloring, a an index card or some type of card that, and a, and a hole punch, because you need to punch a hole into the index card, just a standard size and um, hole punch is what you want. And then a mirror. And if you, if you have a magnifying mirror, I think that probably will work the best because we, we're going to actually count our um, taste buds. And so I think a magnifying mirror probably works best for that, but I think you can probably get or, away otherwise. Or a magnifying glass and a mirror, which is what I have. Yes, yes. yes. Definitely, definitely. I was, you should have seen me trying to find that magnifying glass this morning. I couldn't find it and fortunately realized that I actually did have a magnifying mirror. So I asked my husband, he had an eyeglass repair kit. So I've got, oh. it's got like a little, little tiny one there. Otherwise I was going to use the thing that he uses for soldering, which I think goes on your head and it's got like a whole, <laughs> I, it would have been weird. We are going to record video of this um, that at some point we'll put together a little something uh, just because we have a feeling it's going to be entertaining. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I think it's going to be entertaining. And yeah. then once we're done, we're actually both going to then take a peek at some of our DNA traits that we have as as they re reflect on taste and how they reflect um, perhaps our genetic predispos predispositions to taste. So let's mm -hmm. see how many we have and then let's see what we like. Awesome. Wish you could cook delicious food but feel like you never have the time, money, or energy? At Big Flavors from a Tiny Kitchen, Ashley gets it. She believes that anyone can create amazing meals, regardless of their experience, budget, or kitchen size. Her approach breaks down the barriers that many of us have to cooking and inspires confidence in the kitchen. Ashley puts her decade plus of culinary experience into creating realistic recipes with flexible options that will actually work in your home kitchen. Whether you're a seasoned pro looking for new inspiration, a new cook just getting your bearings, or a busy mom who needs family favorite meals fast, Big Flavors is in your corner to help you create meals and memories. Visit BigFlavorsTinyKitchen.com today to find new and inspiring recipes that will help you make the most of mealtime. Okay, well that was an adventure. <laughs> that was uh, an adventure. Yeah, so Lisa had a much easier time with this than I did. Um, I think partially, if you have a magnifying mirror, I think that's going to be super helpful. I have this teeny tiny little magnifying glass, and it made it a little tricky. <laughs> so what did what did you end up with, Lisa? So I actually ended up with 15. 15 taste buds. in the size of a standard hole punch. Yes, yes. Okay. What so I couldn't figure out how to count. There were so many, and I tried all sorts of things. Lisa had a very <laughs> interesting view of me doing various <laughs> things with mirrors, trying to get by the light. I went into the bathroom, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but then she recommended enlisting my son to count. And luckily for me, I feel a little relieved because he was like, there's so many, this is really hard. And then he said he, th he thinks there is about 55 are you serious? Yeah, that's wow. what it, it was like so packed. That's why I was like, I don't even know how to start counting because I feel like I don't know where to start. And then how do I know which ones I've already because it's not like they're in like perfect rows or anything like that. Right. Um, right. They're just kind of there. Yeah. It was kind of like toothbrush bristles, like very mm -hmm. packed in like that. Yeah. So I don't even know if, if 55 is accurate. That's how many he counted. It could be more. It could be less. But um but so sounds significantly like, different than what I you I think had. we can probably say you're a, t a super taster because according <laughs> to the website, and again, guys, this is internet research. Okay? Right. Um, if you count close to 35-ish or more, you're a super taster. Yeah. Which is what you suspected. Mm -hmm. If you counted 15 or more, 15 to 35, you're a medium taster. And if okay. you're less than 15, you're what's called a non-taster. I actually counted 15, so I'm kind of right on that border, I guess, of a non-taster, medium taster type of thing. So I thought that was really interesting. And um, yours were easy to count. Yeah. So when That's you, why she when came I, back right away. She's like, boom, fifth, about 15. I was like, right. I don't know what to do. <laughs> so when I put the blue food coloring on my tongue and finally got it off my teeth, <laughs> um, <laughs> what it does is, is that your taste buds are, what do you call that? Pap What's papillae the, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, that's it. That's the term. The, the, so the little taste buds, the pap 
the papili. I can't say I don't that, know how guys. To we'll go it. with it. Or just go with it. Um, they kind of stay kind of pinkish looking. And then, but the tongue part turns blue. And so that's, you know, I could, I could see mine pretty, pretty easily there. Definitely. So that's so interesting that we have such wide varieties. Yeah. But, you know, I suspected at the, you know, when we first started talking that I was not even close to being a super taster, mm-hmm. which is accurate by this as, and you really suspected that you were, no wonder you can taste I, garlic if you're. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I like sometimes I used to very much dislike chamomile. Um, I don't mind it now sometimes if it's well balanced, but I could tell if there was like even the teensiest amount of chamomile in like a tea blend. And sometimes my husband would be like this, no, it's not chamomile. And I'd say, get me the container. Let me look at the ingredients. And sometimes, cause you know, on an ingredient list, the first ingredient is what there's the most of, and it works mm-hmm. its way down. Whatever's listed last, there's the least amount of that. It would be the last ingredient and I could still pick up on it. So, um, I always had a this, feeling. <laughs> that is fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, so when we, you know, after we did this, while um, Ashley was trying to count all of those <laughs> taste buds that she had, I was over um, on Ancestry. So I have tested my DNA from a genealogy standpoint, um, actually at all of the databases at this point. But um, I was over at my one on Ancestry.com because they do come back with the traits uh, feature. And I wanted to see specifically looking at things that related to taste, what that, how that matched up with, and what I liked, how that matched up with my DNA results. So I thought it was, I thought it was rather interesting. They, some of the things that came out had to do with things like a bitter sensitivity. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'd be curious to know what your, so when I click on bitter sensitivity, it tells me that my DNA results suggest, and again, it just says suggest that I am able to taste certain bitter flavors, like um, the in Brussels sprouts, kale, other vegetables like that. It, I thought it was interesting. It doesn't say whether I like it or not. It just says I my DNA suggests that I have a high sensitivity to it or I can taste it. So, which I actually really like these particular vegetables. So I thought that was an interesting um, thought thought about that. So Lisa, I have a I have a free ancestry account. I did a test years ago, a DNA test, mm-hmm. and then um a couple years ago me and my husband both added the DNA traits cuz that's like an add-on. So if you've already submitted your DNA there, you can just add it on. It wasn't expensive. Um and I figured it was would be interesting. Um but so if you're logged into your account, I think they keep changing where it's located, but if you do ancestry.com/traits, you can find it. And I think if you have a paid account like Lisa, you'll have more information than what I have, but there's still um, a decent amount of stuff in there. Right. And if you're in, once you're in Ancestry, if you hover over the DNA button, if you're on the paid account, it, it will give you the drop down. You'll have a oh, yeah, I have that button too. as well. Mm-hmm. So whether free or a paid account, if you hover, if you click on the drop down at the top menu for DNA, it will give you, you'll see a drop down and can hit traits at that yeah. point. As long as you've, uh, bought that additional yes feature or whatever and i can't yes. remember if it if it unlocks it right away or if you have to wait well, it's been so long since i've done it I, later yeah. i don't i don't remember it's been so long since i've done that uh, i'm not 100 percent sure if it doesn't show up right away just check mm-hmm. back it may it just may need to run its algorithm yep. a little bit more but anyway, so when I go, in, I'll, I'm looking specifically at things that have to do with taste. Mm-hmm. And so this isn't, as I talked about the bitter sensitivity. Now, this one isn't a taste, but maybe it is in a sense. But the caffeine intake one really was funny because you guys know how much I love caffeine. <laughs> you know, I, I have a coffee man way back in my history, you know, so this is this is family history here, guys. And when I click on it, it says that I am more likely. To, it suggests that I drink more caffeine than average. <laughs> so does mine and so there's like a it's like a line with increments little dashes and increments and then you have a dot on that line either like low medium or high mine is all the way on the right uh likely to drink a lot more caffeine than average um and the low oh. end says less than one drink daily the high end says five drinks or more mm-hmm. daily i don't drink that much caffeine i mean i do drink caffeine i like it a lot but I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> um, so mine is actually to the right of center. So I'm kind of, I would probably say three, you know, based yeah. on this graph, we'll probably more three. The interesting thing is, now guys, you have to remember, I have a full 
family history tree over at Ancestry.com because that's what I do as a genealogy researcher. But um, it does tell you if you have a family tree, if you you know have that paid version, have the family tree at Ancestry, it says that the DNA for this coffee intake is more influenced from my um, my is this parent number one side. Well, that's my father's side. And guess what? Guess where the coffee man <laughs> is in my family tree? It's on oh, my from funny. my dad's side of the family. So I hope. Oh, isn't that cool? And for each of those um, different traits, you can click on it, and it'll bring you more information. So when you click mm-hmm. on, um, I clicked on. Oh, I guess I clicked on bitter sensitivity. Um, if you dislike vegetables, it may be in your genes. Brussels sprouts, kale, and similar vegetables contain glucose, glu, mm, glucosinolates, which taste bitter to some people. <laughs> um, and it'll tell you, it says, for me, uh, your DNA suggests you're able to taste a certain bitter flavor. And then it's, if I wanted to become a member, I could see which parents influence a DNA had more influence on those traits. Um, but so what it does underneath there, if you scroll down, it'll ask you, is your trait result accurate? And as more people answer those things, it kind of refines it based on, uh, that's how it's kind of predicting, I think, right? Based on Mm -hmm. what other people with similar DNA say. So it says, um, bitter sensitivity levels are at least 20% genetic at most 80% environmental. Um, and let's see, uh, it says, did you know, because taster or non-taster status for PTC, which is some very long (laughs) scientific word for a bitter chemical found in foods. Um, Because it's passed down and easy to test, even a baby can pull a face when they taste something bitter. Sensitivity to that was often used for proving paternity before DNA testing was available. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Well, I think that is so interesting because so much of, you know... That they were using as a standard because um, it's that you know again it says at least eighty percent is environmental mm-hmm. of whether you like it or not so that's an interesting yeah and my bitter sensitivity again on the scale of low to high is all the way to the right on high and I used to hate bitter things I have come around a long ways and I enjoy a lot of them now but I am very sensitive to it for sure where does uh, yours where does yours fall I'm high as well I'm high yeah. on that and I do like like I said I do like those guys those vegetables, definitely. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious about cilantro because mm. you know, that's one you hear about a lot. And I'm curious where you fell on that. So mine says that I'm all the way to the left of dislike cilantro, but I very much like cilantro. Have you always liked it or have you kind of trained yourself to like it? I think I can't remember. I mean, I feel like maybe the first or second time I had it, I definitely understood why some people think it tastes soapy. Um, But I don't think I ever necessarily disliked it. Like bitter foods, I definitely disliked for a long time. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure. And I think my mom likes cilantro, um, even though that's definitely one of those kind of polarizing ingredients. Yes, yeah, so mine was that suggests that I do like cilantro, which I do. I'm kind of to the right. I'm kind of midway mm-hmm. to the right of um, the the middle there. But I will say though, for me, I actually kind of had to train myself to mm-hmm. like it because originally it would I you know would taste that soapiness to it. Yeah, and but I guess I've just had it in enough dishes over time in dishes that I otherwise enjoy that I just developed a mm-hmm. like for it. Um, well, there's so. something like with, uh, with babies when you're, you know, introducing new foods or toddlers or whatever, how if you, you got to try something seven times, I think, to know if you really mm. like it or don't like it. I don't know how accurate that is, but. I don't know. It seemed pretty accurate with my children. I'll say yeah. that. Well, because um, the first time you try something, you might just be like, whoa, 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 what is this? It's new and different. That doesn't necessarily mean you don't like it. Um, so being exposed to an ingredient in different ways can for sure help with that. I, I think you're absolutely right. Just different ways. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes for children, it can be a textural thing as well mm-hmm. um, with that. So, um, all right. So Ashley, where did you fall on sweet sensitivity? let's see let me scroll sweet sensitivity extra sensitive which I think is accurate because I I mean I like sweets but I'm not 
I don't like cloyingly sweet or like super, super sweet. I know we've talked about like Cadbury eggs before. It's too much for me. Lisa loves them. <laughs> All right, guys. So I actually tested extra sensitive to sweets as well. But the difference is, I guess, I like that extra sweet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In fact, guys, when I was a little girl growing up, my grandfather would um, would cook. And he was um, a cook in the CCC camps. And he, um, you know, he learned how to cook. And so he was a really good cook. And he would always tell me when he was cooking, he goes, well, I have a sweet tooth. I'm making, you know, these yummy apples because I have a sweet tooth. And I would always ask him, which tooth is it? Because I wanted to know which tooth was the sweet tooth because I had a sweet tooth too. And I wanted to know which tooth it was. That is adorable. (laughs) Never did find out. (laughs) So they have an interesting number of like food and drink related ones in here. The one that I thought was the most entertaining uh, is asparagus odor. I think many of you probably know what this is referring to, but it's um, whether or not you're able to smell asparagus when it metabolizes. So when you <laughs> use the restroom after you eat asparagus, um, it's mine says uh, I'm like. Not all the way to the left on unable to smell, but like a little bit to the left. But I'm definitely able to smell it. Uh, mine says I don't. Uh, that suggest it suggests that I do not have that. That I can't smell it, and I can't. Uh, it's so weird. Like some people just legitimately don't smell that, um, mm-hmm. which would be lovely. But ima- <laughs> so, but doesn't that make you wonder? Because it's not. I mean, it's just a, it's weird. It's a weird thing to be able to smell something because of something you've eaten later. It's a weird thing to test for. But like, what, but but like, so what if there, if you just don't smell it at all, like you might not have even known this existed. So what if there are things that we have no idea even exist, but other people are like, whoa, like, you know what I mean? Like if it's really off-putting and you don't even know. It's so crazy. Yeah. um when because when that came up as you know one of the categories, I was like, "What in the world? Why would you even? Who even thought that? You know, why would you think yeah. that up? It just what it, that one never mm-hmm. was on my radar. Definitely, it, yeah. it does make me wonder because um, it's kind of a sulfur smell. So I'm wondering um, sensitivity to s- smelling sulfur. Mm. My little brain, my bi- biology. I, I'm a former biology major, and so you know, it made me think. I'm like, well. Does that mean you can't smell other types of sulfur? Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when you boil eggs, does that... uh, I can smell, but my husband is super sensitive to it. In fact, Mm. I can't boil eggs when he's in the house. For me, it's not an issue. Interesting. So, yeah, on the when I click on the asparagus odor, I'm going to answer the survey after eating asparagus. Do you notice a distinct odor in your urine? I'm going to click yes. Um... You have to consent to the DNA survey. So yes. now it says, um, you know, that helps them refine the results or whatever. So, yeah. So that's an interesting, interesting one. I don't think they're all, like, for sure accurate, but. Um, mm. Well, it's kind of like we talked about earlier that so many of them, it gives you the breakdown of, you know, your DNA suggests this. Mm-hmm. And it then says, you know. It'll kind of give you the breakdown as well. I think on the asparagus odor one, it was, was it 4% genetic? Mm-hmm. And yeah. 96% asparagus odor detection is at least 4% genetic, at most 96% environmental. And they're really not 100% sure exactly. But it obviously, we have a lot of other things that can influence those results. But it is mm-hmm. makes for a fun conversation starter. It just does. Saying. Yeah, I mean, it's got things in here like hand-eye coordination, your hair type and color, if you're likely or not to be a goal setter, and mine says all the way unlikely to be a goal setter, which is absolutely incorrect. (laughs) Like, no. Um, And then hangriness, I thought is funny. It says that I'm unlikely to get hangry, and that's... I'm better than I used to be. I used to get real hangry. That's when you're you're hungry, you want to eat something, and you start getting, like, irritable because you're hungry. (laughs) I was looking to see. I was trying to. I don't see that on mine. It's under hand-eye coordination. It oh, says okay. I'm likely to have good hand-eye coordination. I guess I am good at video games, not sports, though. <laughs> um, do I have one that you don't have? I don't know. I've. 
It's just a long list. I just haven't found it yet. As I'm looking for it, I find one that says speed, less speedy when playing sports. I'm like all the way on the end. That's true. I love to run, but I'm not a fast runner. But that doesn't matter. Yeah, mine's all the way over to fastest. It says faster when playing sports. Oh, really? It tells me I'm unlikely to enjoy spicy foods, like all the way to the least amount of likely. But And I didn't used to, but I do now. Like when I was younger, I didn't like spicy food, but I do now. And it says introvert or extrovert, and I am all the way up the scale of for introvert, which is actually quite accurate. <laughs> uh, hangriness. Oh, dear, guys. I am, like, at the top of the scale for most likely to be hangry. And that is probably true. That's it. Some of these, though, it's like um, wisdom teeth. It, it tells me that I'm unlikely to develop all four wisdom teeth, and that's true. I only had two. It said the same thing for me. Yeah. Um, now, the interesting thing is, I did have four. They were not fully developed. They did have to go in and take them out. Uh, two of mine just didn't ever decide to exist. So I guess I actually did have them. I just didn't. Yeah. If they just had to take them out, that they wouldn't come in. Oh, here's an interesting one that'll come to pl- into play in an upcoming episode. Umami sensitivity. I saw it that. Says that. It says umami is the elusive fifth flavor associated with savory foods like meaty broth and seaweed. And it says it, my DNA suggests that I'm less sensitive to that. Um Mine did too. This is I'm less sensitive to it. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Some foods with the highest levels of naturally occurring monosodium glutamate, MSG, include seaweed, fish sauce, soy sauce, and the Australian food spread Vegemite. I have not tried that before. I haven't either. I haven't either. Interesting. So I I'll be really interested to yeah, see in that upcoming episode about how we do how I taste it, because you had sent me some umami spicy and I've never had it. So I'm super mm. excited to be able to try that. Yeah, so definitely stay tuned. We have some, uh, the next couple of episodes are going to be kind of exploring this a little bit more. We'll find the show notes and the bonus material photos and extra video of us actually doing our testing of our taste buds for this episode at passingtheplate.org slash 34. Well, that's a wrap on this episode of Passing the Plate. We hope you enjoyed our journey into the world of food, traditions, and the amazing connections they create. As always, it's been a pleasure sharing these delicious stories with you. Remember, food is more than just sustenance. It's a way to connect the dots between our past, present, and future. And until next time, happy eating, happy connecting, and pass the plate. Head to passingtheplate.org forward slash podcast for show notes. 